All right. Well, hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. We're going to go ahead and get started. The Southeast Mental Health Technology Transfer Center would like to welcome you to today's event, Foundational Skills of Motivational Interviewing. My name is Emily Moore, and I will be moderating today's event. I am joined by the Southeast MHTTC Director, Dr. Ben Druss, who will be introducing our presenter today. A few words about our center, the Southeast MHTTC, before we get started. Please note that the work of our center is supported by a grant from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA. And also please note that our center, as, as well as the larger MHTTC network, all use affirming, respectful, and recovery-oriented language in all of our activities. The Southeast Mental Health Technology Transfer Center is proud to serve the eight states in HHS Region 4. Our expertise in public health programs, systems, research, and evaluation provides a unique lens through which we can address mental health priorities. We encourage you to visit our Southeast MHTTC website, mhttcnetwork.org slash southeast, to learn more about our center and upcoming events. A few important notes before today's event begins. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our website for on-demand viewing in a few days. We encourage you to share your comments throughout the event using the chat feature. Please remember to select chat with all attendees if you would like to share your thoughts with everyone. We have allotted time at the end of the presentation for Q&A. Please submit your question using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Finally, for any participants who are interested, a certificate of attendance is available for download after the completion of our evaluation surveys. I'll now turn it over to Southeast MHTTC Director, Dr. Ben Druss, so that he can introduce today's speaker. Thanks so much, Emily. Uh, so it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce uh, Shireen Khan. Uh, Shireen uh, is the Vice President of Operations and Strategy at Threshold, uh, the largest and oldest provider of mental health services in Chicago, Illinois. She also serves as the social work expert on the clinical expert team for the SAMHSA-funded clinical support system for serious mental illness, also known as SMI Advisor. Shereen's focus is on developing and enacting programs and trainings to improve organizational and workforce effectiveness, particularly for organizations who serve people with mental health conditions. Green has experience in relationship management, clinical supervision, training in clinical evidence-based practices, trauma-informed care, inclusion, diversity, equity, and access, digital health literacy, professional and leadership development, and change implementation in the nonprofit sector. Shireen also serves as the board president of Women Unite, a women-run nonprofit that seeks to increase capacity for organizations that focus on underserved populations in Chicago. Shireen, it's wonderful to have you here, and thank you in advance uh, for this uh, leading us in this uh, presentation. Thanks, Ben, and hello, everybody. Thanks for having me here today. Uh, so today, our topic is on motivational interviewing. Let me just share my screen and get this going. All right, so motivational interviewing is one of my favorite topics to talk about, and I think because it's such a good foundation for any type of um, engaging in your clinical life and also just engaging with, with other people. So today is just an overview. Um, feel free to put your questions in the chat. We're going to cover the whole kind of range of what, um, what it is and some of the key skills. Um, and then there might be opportunity to get a little more in depth at the question and answer portion. So um, what is motivational interviewing? It is a collaborative goal-oriented style of communication with particular attention to the language around change. So its goal is to strengthen the personal motivation for and commitment to this goal by eliciting and exploring their own reasons for change um, with an atmosphere of acceptance and compassion. 
So this was developed by Miller and Rolnick um, originally for substance use, um, really as an evidence-based practice for substance use. Um, but it, it really covers a wider range of that. There's four processes too to motivational interviewing. And so I think if you take anything from today, it's really gonna be to focus on that engaging foundation. So the first process is engagement and that's a, a therapeutic foundation. Um, that's how you build rapport and trust so that a person is then able to uh, get to a place to change themselves. That second process is focusing. That's where you really kind of help with goal development and narrowing in on what the goals are. The third is evoking, which is um, then, you know, evoking commitment to that change based on their goals. And then the last is planning. So typically people in our helping professional were way more comfortable in that planning stage. But really the work for motivational interviewing is done in those earlier stages to help people really identify what it is that they want out of their life and then how their current behaviors are getting in the way of them being able to achieve that. So as I mentioned, it is an evidence-based practice developed to support recovery from addiction originally, but it can also be applied to a wide range of behaviors. So I used it really, really commonly um, with people around physical health issues. So either trying to eat healthier, engage in um, uh, some type of exercise, also a lot around medication management and helping people um, yeah, understand why they wanna take their medication and to manage their medications better. Um, also, it can be used for self-harm. Um, there's a, like really any type of any type of behavior change where people are um, just feeling like their ambivalence is high about it. This is really where motivational interviewing comes in. Um, another reason I love motivational interviewing is that people don't know that you're doing motivational interviewing. You're really just showing up kindly, compassionately, and helping to figure out what's important to them. Um, and then, you know, um, challenging them when they're not following um, what following through with what they think they should be doing. So it is, um, yeah, it's definitely uh, one of my favorite because it is just an approach and a style, but it's not a passive therapy as well. There's kind of a myth out there that with motivational interviewing, you just completely follow the client's lead. And it's true that we follow their lead in terms of identifying what they want and we use their own language and we really help to hold up a mirror to them. Uh, but we definitely are the experts in the change process and that person is the expert in themselves. So it's not just a completely passive um, counseling style. Another analogy that they commonly used is that, you know, that person is the driver and you're the passenger, but you're the one who's kind of helping them with directions, right? If you think about like a road trip. So I'm going to talk a little bit more um, about, you know, ambivalence and confidence and desire, but basically motivational interviewing is really helpful when ambivalence is high and people are unsure of the change um, or where their confidence is low um, and they're not sure if they're able to make the change. Also, if their desire is low about whether or not they want to make that change and whether the importance is low or the disadvantages, the disadvantages of change are high. Um, so just a quick thought exercise. You do not need to uh, say anything out loud. If you'd like to put it in the chat, you can, but you don't need to. This is just to help us kind of remember how difficult change is. I'm not doing this exercise to make you feel bad that you're not going to the gym. Um, I just want you to kind of think about change for a second. So just think about a time that you've wanted to make a change, any change that you thought was important and you wanted to make a change. And now just think about, were you able to successfully implement that change? And if you were able to implement it, were you able to maintain that change? And if you were able to maintain that change, how many tries did it take for you to maintain that? So like I said, I just want you to do that thought so you can kind of recognize how difficult change is, even if you identify it's something that's really important to you. So, you know, I can share, I'm on my probably 800th attempt at getting a regular workout um, routine. I finally had to join a gym that you pay if you don't show up for classes. So that one seems to be working. But for me, it's something I know is extremely important. It helps me with my mental health, my physical health, my stress, my sleep. But still, it's hard to kind of maintain that change. And for people who have mental health conditions, and even um, particularly people who have serious mental health conditions, 
you know, there's a lot of barriers to maintaining, implementing, to implementing and maintaining a change. It could be something like executive functioning issues. It could be just their life circumstances, right? Um, it could be that they're only, you know, their social supports are only set up for to engage in this type of behavior. So there's a lot of reasons why change is difficult, but also everyone has the motivation to change. It's up to us to figure out what that motivation is and to then elicit it from the person. When I talk too long on a slide, it freezes. So it'll just give me a second to move to the next one. Okay, great. So this is the spirit of motivational interviewing, and this is key and foundational um, and how I would hope that people engage with any client, regardless of if you're using motivational interviewing or not, no matter what therapy style or if you're doing case management or if you're doing um, you know, psychiatry. This is how I would hope that people would engage with clients and really just engage with other people as well. So the spirit really is what we need um, throughout the entire process, but is especially helpful in that first stage where we are engaging. So the partnership. So this is a collaborative process, as I mentioned. It's not that passive treatment. We're the experts in change, and they are the experts in themselves. And that's really how we see um, we see change in motivational interviewing. Um, the second spirit piece of the spirit is acceptance. So that's a non-judgmental stance. That's how we're just seeking to understand their experiences and their perspective. Um, and that's you know how we use those open-ended questions to really elicit information. Um, and to be just generally curious about somebody. I found a lot of success if you just speak to somebody and with a genuine interest in getting to know them, um, then I find that you have greater success in really eliciting what it is and who they are. Um, so that's acceptance. The third is compassion. So that is actively promoting and prioritizing their welfare and generally just caring for the person and showing up in that way in your contact with them. And then the last spirit is evocation, right? So this is that curiosity, but taking it a step further by really trying to draw out of them what are their values, what's important to them, what gets them out of bed in the morning. Those are the reasons that people change. Of course, people can change overnight. People can have external consequences, um, you know, that are pretty major, or they can wake up one day and just decide, you know, we've heard the expression cold turkey. But typically the way that change happens is by first understanding why it's important, then you know getting to a place where you feel confident enough, able enough, you're interested enough, your motivation is high enough, and then you work through the barriers to successfully implement that change. So those are the four spirit, the spirit of motivational interviewing. Um, and it, like I said, it can be applied across any counseling strategy and just a general way to approach treatment with people. Okay, so we are gonna dive into some of the skills today and the key concepts. So um, first we're gonna talk about the stages of change and then we'll get into some key skills that you can start practicing immediately. So firstly, the stages of change are just a really important thing for us to understand and one of the foundations to motivational interviewing. So as I mentioned before, change doesn't necessarily happen overnight. It typically moves through these five or six stages when we count relapse. Uh, and people will go up and down through these stages and relapse, or it doesn't have to be with substance use, but a return to the old behavior is a normal part of this process and something that happens. It's not that somebody, and they might be partial, they might partially re-engage, um, but, and it doesn't mean that they need to go all the way back down to the initial stage. If we get to relapse, it means that they just um, need to get back into action again. So the five stages are pre-contemplation, where that's where somebody does not yet identify that they have a problem. Um, so this can be, even if we're looking and they clearly to us, you know, they're doing something harmful for themselves. Um, this is still, uh, somebody has not identified that it's a problem yet. So you might hear, you know, no, I don't know, or they might not be talking to you about it at all even. Uh, the next stage is contemplation, and this is where the bulk of the work is done in motivational interviewing. When um, we're at, actually I'll talk about the goals in a second, but when we're at pre-contemplation stage, we're not trying to implement any type of change because the person has not yet identified that they're a pro it's a problem. Contemplation is where they're starting to identify that maybe this is a problem, and that's where we really do the bulk of our motivational interviewing work. Then once we get to preparation, where somebody identifies that they do, they not only identify this problem, they understand they have to do something about it. 
And then we have action, which is they're starting to make steps towards the change. Maintenance is where they're maintaining or keeping up with the change. And then I already kind of talked about relapse. So our goals in these different stages in pre-contemplation, um, our only goal there is to establish that therapeutic alliance. So we're really just trying at that point to engage with somebody, establish that safe and trusting place that they feel comfortable to share enough for us. Another thing you're doing, in pre, it doesn't mean you're not doing anything in pre-contemplation, especially if the behavior is um, risky, right? That's where we're really using our harm reduction skills. We're still educating around the issue itself. We're not ignoring it, uh, but we're not yet expecting or um, trying to push for change. We're really just trying to get to a place where they're comfortable talking with us about what that behavior is. That second stage is contemplation. As I mentioned, that's where we're gonna spend a lot of our time. Um, and that is where we're really there just to kind of elicit and support change talk. I'll share with you in just a moment what change talk is so we can get to that. But in contemplation, that is where we're eliciting and supporting that change talk. And um, yeah, just focusing, focusing on helping them understand what the issue is, what they want out of their lives, what the behavior change is that would be helpful. Um, and then we can move into preparation. That's building motivation and assisting in goal development, addressing any barriers there might be to change. Um, you know, and then um, and then we move into action. There's action planning worksheets even, um, but action is where, like I said, we're pretty comfortable. And then maintenance is where you develop a relapse prevention plan and how do you maintain the change? A relapse prevention plan, once again, is not just used for um, um, substance use. They have them for all different kinds of behaviors and it's an important part of this. Um, so yeah, I think one of the most common things I see when I do uh, consulting for teams and newer clinicians, when they're frustrated with a client, it's because they've moved ahead of them in their stage of change. So really what we're doing here is meeting people where they are. And we do that by recognizing and understanding where they are in terms of this change, and then using uh, interventions that kind of address that change, right? And we wanna use the interventions in a way that we roll with the resistance rather than um, you know, creating a, a discord or a conflict. Um, so yeah, they call it dance. They, it's called still rolling with resistance. They tried to change it to dancing with discord at one point, but for whatever reason, didn't catch on. But that is what, when you're really engaging in motivational interviewing, that is what it feels like. It feels like a dance back and forth, right? Um, and so you're really just using your um, counseling skills to kind of dance with the person um, and help them push through that resistance toward change. And I think another key thing to remember is that, um, you know, behaviors take a while to like learn, right? And there's a reason that people are engaging in these behaviors. So behaviors serve a purpose. And even if it's something that we don't do or that we see as really problematic, it still is um, that behavior is serving that person, right? that substance use is make, reducing their anxiety, um, whatever it might be, you know, they're, um, they're, they're yelling at their partner regularly, that is serving as some type of release. So there's a purpose to why people engage in risky behaviors. And so it's helpful to understand that. Um, and then it can, you know, help you have more empathy for why they're doing that. It serves some purpose. And sometimes before people can move through contemplation into preparation, we need to identify what that purpose is and replace that with something else, right? Before they're able to successfully like make that change. Okay, so key thing here in motivational interviewing is change talk. So change talk is any kind of language that relates to the possibility of change. Um, and the more change talk that you hear in this process, the more likely somebody is to actually engage in that change. So uh, change talk is any statement indicating a movement or interest towards change, but it's also on the opposite side, it can be any distress or discomfort with the way things are. So, you know, it can be, um, I'm sick of waking up with a hangover, right? Uh, that's not saying that they want to quit drinking necessarily, but they're dissatisfied with the way things are. So one of the primary goal here of motivational interviewing is to create the safe place for change talk to emerge. On the other side of things, sustained talk is the opposite of change talk. So sustained talk is any um, language that indicates a disinterest or unreadiness towards change. 
um, unwillingness, disinterest, yeah, um, a fear of, um, you know, what they uh, currently are doing and letting go of that and what that might mean. So sustained talk is the opposite. So we're just going to do a quick poll. Um, there's just five statements about change talk, five statements, general statements. And I want you just to indicate whether you think this is a change talk statement or a sustained talk statement. So we'll do that through the poll. I'll give you just under a minute to do that. Okay. I'm not seeing the result, but I think we're good to, I'll give you another 30 seconds and then we'll just walk through it quickly together. <clears throat> Okay, so the first one, um, oh, all right. <laughs> Thank you, I was like, I need to see that thing. Okay, the first one, I think I'm doing about as well as I can at this point. 85% um, of people said sustained talk and that's correct. That is a um, satisfaction with the way things are, which indicates sustained talk. Um, and the second one is, uh, I've always just disliked exercise, right? 90% uh, of people identified that sustained talk. In this case, we're assuming the change would be to implement some type of exercise. The third one, I am sick of feeling so stressed all the time. Um, so that is change talk. And 87% of people answer that correctly, right? They're not identifying yet what it is they're going to change, but they're identifying a uh, dissatisfaction with how things are with their stress levels. Um, number four, I probably could exercise more. May, most people got that, right? Even though it's probably, it still is a change talk statement, right? That's indicating that there is some interest or ability. They feel able to make that change. I'm going to take my medication every day. That is um, change talk, correct? Yeah, sometimes this one has confused people in the past. We're assuming at this point that they want to take the medication every day. So that's change talk, right? They're really committing at that point to that change. Okay, great. I just wanted to do that quick exercise um, to keep you engaged and also just help you see the difference between the two. So, oh, wow, okay. Um, so the different types of change talk. So in motivational interviewing, we also really love acronyms. Um, I feel like in most therapies, we love acronyms, but this is the DARN C. So this is a way for you to indicate change talk. So the DARN C, the, is the, the D is desire. So that's they're expressing a desire, interest in change. And that's where you'll hear words like I want, I wish, things like that. Ability is that um, expresses a confidence or belief that they can change. So that's where you hear, I should be able, I can, I could. Um, you know, something really, really helpful to identify ability is to help people look at what they've done in the past. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the same change, but as long as they've been able to make a change in the past, then it makes them feel more able and confident to make a change in the future. Um, the R is reason, right? So that's kind of those values that you might hear. So what's the reason or rationale for change, right? So family, health, safety, those are values that people hold. And that is uh, the best way to in, um, identify the reason for change. Need, um, they need to, right? That could be where they're having like serious consequences. Like if I don't stop drinking this much soda, then I will, um, you know, my diabetes will get worse, just an example. So that's the need and you'll hear I have to, right? And then commitment. So that is where they're ready to commit to implementing the change. And that's where you'll start to hear, that's where we're moving more into that preparation stage. So um, these are the different types of change talk. And when we're hearing, when we'll know when we're ready to kind of move forward towards the stages is when you're hearing more change talk. Um, when they're asking more questions about change, um, when they're looking ahead, right? With confidence, they're saying, well, when I'm able to do this or when this is different, right? That's another way. Um, and they're, or they're identifying, if I were going to make this change, what would that look like? So that's that um, interest in taking some initial steps. And then having um, dissatisfaction with the present situation is another big indicator, like increasing dissatisfaction that they might be ready to move towards that stage towards change. Okay, so we're gonna explore some key skills here. Um, so they're called ORs, um, another acronym. 
And um, I'll get into what they are in a moment, but oars are also, um, you know, supposed to be used like, right, to like kind of move people through water. So it's another analogy we can think of is that we're helping to kind of paddle with this person through. So the oars are open-ended questions. So that is um, asking open-ended questions, which we'll get into, to get more information um, and just, yeah, to get inf enough information for you to be able to kind of um, help move them through the stages. Affirmations, that's just affirming um, and validating the person's experience. Then we have reflections or reflective listening. For me, this is the key skill to motivational interviewing. Um, Open-ended questions are as well, but reflections are really, really targeted, accurate, or reflections are very, very effective in holding up a mirror to somebody and helping them understand more about themselves. Um, so key skill, and you could take a whole course just on trying to do reflections, but that takes practice as well. And then summarization, so that's just connecting the dots. Um, we all probably use summarizations at the end of like a session, for example, but with this, we use it to kind of reinforce key points. So this is a whole list, <laughs> a long list of open-ended questions. Um, and if anyone wants to share in the chat, I'll give you just a moment to read through it. If any of these, you know, have been successful for you and you want to point that out, or if you have any really good open-ended questions that you use with clients, you can also put that in the chat just to share with the group. But like I said, these open-ended questions are key and they're used differently at different stages, right? So in that initial engaging stage, we're using open-ended questions to get to know people. And then once we get into evoking, we're using open-ended questions to identify what's important to them in their lives. And then as we're moving you know, a little bit further into focusing, we're using those open-ended questions to help people build that interest, confidence, and ability that they can make that change. So yeah, if anyone wants to share, you can put some in the chat um, if any of these stand out to you. Or like I said, if you have any good ones. So, you know, what's really worked for me, like I already mentioned, is looking be, looking back and then looking ahead. Um, so any of those types of uh, open-ended questions. Um, and I think, you know, people typically um, hear of the, um, the miracle question. I'm a little hesitant to use that one exactly. If you wave a, wave a magic wand, you know, what would be different? Because I feel like, especially people that I've worked with who have been in the mental health system for years, they kind of know that one. But I think you can say, um, yeah, if anything could be different, like what would your life look like if you didn't have to worry about this, right? Um, somebody put, yeah, what do you need right now? That's really helpful too in the beginning or for people who are overwhelmed. So for people who have multiple changes that they need to make or for people who have are having a really, really hard time in life, right? Um, I think to help them kind of focus in and narrow that down. And this actually just reminded me of a key point that I should have mentioned earlier, that people are at different stages for different change. So if people have multiple changes that they identify are important to make. They can be at different stages for that change. And I've had more success when I've kind of have focused on, um, yeah, just trying to remember that and focus on one at a time, but sometimes you can't do that. So I think that that's just a key point. So I'm glad that person asked that question because that made me think of that. Yeah, it's really helpful for growth. What does this mean, right? Um, how can how can I help you? A common one people ask too when somebody walks in the door is just, you know, what would you like to work on today? What would you like to focus on today? Um, what concerns you about the way things are now? Um, yeah, what's getting in the way of what you would like? Um, in the past, have you successfully made a change? What did that look like? Um, yeah, so I think how would your relationship be different with your mother if you made a change, right? Um, so yeah, what resources can I help you with? Great. Okay, so yeah, I think share, you can share some good ones in there if you have them. Um, and we want to continue to use these open-ended questions. Like I said, they get different. In the beginning, you're using them as a tool to get to know somebody. And then as you move towards it, you're using them in a way to kind of um, elicit um, more of that change talk, right? I think this is, let me see, this is the poll. Okay, no, here's the next one, poll. We're doing another poll. I'm trying to, okay. So um, in, you're gonna have the polls up right now. So just determine whether it's an open-ended or a closed-ended question. And there's six questions here. Okay. 
Okay. And I think whenever you want to close it, I'll yeah, I can do another 30 seconds. Okay. Okay, so in the past, how have you overcome an important obstacle in your life? Um, that is an open-ended question, correct? Yeah, because you're giving them, they have to share in their own words how they overcame that obstacle. Um, the second, what consequences of diabetes does your doctor talk to you about most? That is actually a closed-ended question. So I made these tricky on purpose because that is them just repeating from a list. So a, clo a closed ended question isn't just yes or no, it's also anything that indicates a list. So you, for example, um, what did you have for breakfast this morning, right? So while your, your answer will be different for each person, that is still a closed ended question. There's also a time and place for closed ended questions to gather more information, um, but this one is, um, yeah, a closed ended question. So what do you also, this one is closed ended. What do you want to do about smoking, quit, cut down, or keep it the same? That's also closed ended um, because that um, is just a few options, right? <clears throat> Number four, have you ever thought about walking as a simple form of exercise? That is also a closed ended question. Um, that is just a yes or no, right? Um, if you said, you know, have you ever thought about um improving your health in the past? Or have you ever thought about doing more physical activity in the past? And then what did that look like? That would be a follow-up, right? Um, so some of these you could say, right? So you could ask Beth, have you ever thought about walking? And then you can follow it up with, you know, how did that go? What do you like about it? What did you not like about it? And this one, great, everybody got this. What brings you in today? That is an open-ended question, right? And a common one that you can use just to engage people. Um, and then what do you like about drinking? Also an open-ended question. I threw that one in there too, because I think that, you know, it's important for us to understand what people like about the behaviors as well, and not just what they want to change. So that's important thing for us to try to help is to determine what they like. So that way um, we know more about what we would need to put in place for them to be able to change, right? So great job. All right. That was the poll slide, oh well, okay. Um, another key skill here is affirmations. So this is a statement to the person um, that is a type of praise or, affir or validation, uh, normalization. Um, and so really though, I wanna just be clear, we don't just, as people call it cheerlead, right? We're not just there to cheer along everything that people do. Affirmations should be targeted statements that are done. So um, yeah, it can be praise, statements of appreciation or understanding, and they're used to reinforce that rapport and engage progress. So um, praise around their ability, their motivation, validation, and then normalization comparing to others. So I use normalization um, as I, I kind of used it in the beginning with you all when I mentioned you know, some of my challenges with exercising regularly. So this is also, yeah, just normalization is when you compare to um, others and not in a way to make it feel like they're not alone, right? A lot of people feel um, isolated or like that they're the only, why can't I make this change? I'm the only one struggling. So normalization is also one of the affirmation skills. Okay, um, then as I mentioned, reflections. So reflections are these key kind of skills, um, the key skill that is, is newer to motivational interviewing, not newer to motivational interviewing, but different than other types of uh, counseling. So they're used to hold up that mirror and to really deepen somebody's understanding and meaning as they explore. So they're simple reflections and those are the repeating or restating reflections. So um, these are used kind of depending either in early stages, um, or as you're just trying to get to know somebody, or I use repeating if it's something particularly traumatic that somebody is talking about, I'll just stick to their language, uh, or something that they feel shame about, I once again will stick to their language. Um, but typically the way I use reflections would be to, in the beginning, um, you know, just start 
and then build from there. So I also would start with more of a simple reflection as I build towards those more deeper reflections. And when we use these reflections, the person feels that you're really truly hearing them and that you want to understand them and they want to be understood. And um, so reflections are these kind of like educated guesses that we're making based on the information that we have, particularly when we get into the, the more complex reflections. But even if we're wrong, there's definitely times where I've said, you know, it sounds like this. And they're like, nope. <laughs> um, but even by doing that, we're still getting more information and clarification and giving them an opportunity to, um, you know, to share more about their experience and to clarify. So these types that I listed here, once again, I said we could do a whole training on reflections. There's the repeating. So that's verbatim, just stating back. Somebody says, I really want to start taking my medications again. And you say, you really want to start taking your medications again. Restating, which is where the content changes, but you slightly kind of alter um, alter that. So instead of, I really want to start taking my medication today, you might say, um, taking your medication um, is something that you'd like to start doing, right? Uh, paraphrasing is another one, which is where you're making a guess about meaning. So you're putting the statement into um, your own words. Um, so you can kind of just put a little like spin on that. So when we do paraphrasing, a few different types of reflections that fall under that are amplified. So that is reflecting what they say in kind of an exaggerated way. I've had success with this type of reflection as well. So this encourages them to, um, you know, kind of stop trying to prove their point um, about why they can't change and try to elicit the other side of the ambivalence. So an example of this is I'm only seeing you because my girlfriend said um, that you come here. So you might say back, so um, so you get nothing else out of coming here except, you know, her uh, getting off your back about it. Right. And then they hopefully they would be like, well, so that's a, an example of a um, an amplified reflection. And another type of reflection that I want to point out is this double sided reflection. So that's where you look at both sides of somebody's ambivalence. So it's really important for people to um, feel like you understand that there are these two sides. Right. And that um, ambivalence is that. So if they say something like, I don't like what smoking does to my health, but it really does help me reduce my stress. And you might say, on the one hand, um, smoking brings you relief from your stress. And on the other hand, you're really concerned about what it's doing to your physical health. And then this last one here is the reflection of feeling. And that's where you go underneath the um, surface to really understand the emotional impact of what they're saying. And that um, is the deepest form of reflection. And that can be used. Um, yeah, that's the deepest form of reflection. And that should be used once you kind of have a good idea of what you think is going on with somebody. Okay. Hopefully people can't see my team's chat too. Some, my team is talking about their lunch, what they're getting for lunch today. <laughs> All right. Um, and the last key skill here is summarization. So that's used to reinforce material um, that has already been discussed. And it's done periodically through the um, session, right? So we all, like I said, hopefully do summarizations at the end of a um, at the end of a uh, session to kind of reinforce and just kind of go through what it is that we were talking about um, and make sure people check for understanding. But we use summarizations here to connect those dots and to um, reinforce important points. So if you're going through and you're doing a lot of open-ended questions, summarizations, you're really exploring that ambivalence, then you would want to, um, at that point, do a summarization and check for understanding. <clears throat> so um, then they're also used to um, illuminate contradictions or ambivalence in what somebody's saying, and then encouraging them to hear their own change talk, right? So that is us also reinforcing uh, what we're doing. Okay. Other things are summarization is anytime you're stuck, just take a moment and then you can kind of um, use that um, when you're not sure what direction to go in, right? So you can just take a moment, allow each of you to regroup before you move to the next topic. <clears throat> and then you also want to, like I said, check for understanding. So have I got this right? Did I miss anything? Is that close to what you're describing? Okay. I'm checking the time because I think I have time to show you a really great motivational interviewing tool called the readiness ruler um, because we have 10 minutes until Q&A. So if you just give me a moment, I'm gonna pull that up. For
for you. And I want to share that. I didn't think we'd have time, but um, it looks like we do. So the readiness ruler, um, if anyone has heard of that or not, the readiness ruler is a really helpful tool um, to use with people in motivational interviewing. And so it has basically, um, it involves three different areas that I've mentioned quite a bit. So it goes through the importance and the confidence and the interest in making a change. And so um, when we use this tool, it can be done. Uh, you don't need to pull it out, although you can, but you don't need to share it. Here, let me try to pull it. I'm trying to send it to myself. Um, you can be done in um, in conversation style, or you can actually pull the readiness ruler up. That also works. And so what you do is you go through those three different areas, and you would talk with somebody about whether or not um, how confident they are, how able they are, and how interested they are. And what we do is we ask these questions. So we would ask kind of, it's a scale rating, and we would ask questions um, from a scale of one to 10, how confident are you in making that change? And then we would ask um, on a scale of one to 10. Um, and so based on what they say, if they give us a four, we would say, okay, okay, great, here it is. I'm gonna pull it up right now. Let's try to find it and talk at the same time and multitasking was hard. All right, let me share it. Okay, so here is this readiness ruler. So basically what we would do is we would go through and say, okay, we've identified a change that somebody wants to make. And now we're getting into the points where we want to, um, you know, figure out how we can help them make that change. So if somebody has a change, for example, let's just stick with exercise. So I said, how important is it to make this change? And if they say, you know, it's a five right in the middle. So what I would ask them then is how important is it or why did they pick a five? and not a three, right? And you might ask, why would I ask them if they, why they'd go lower? But what that does is it gives you information about why they um, do feel confident and important enough to make this change, right? And then the other side of it, we would ask, um, what would it take for you to be at an eight? And that gives us information about the things we would need to do and plan in order for them to make that change. So it goes through importance, confidence, and uh, ability. And so for some people, they might be really high on, um, you know, they might be really high on importance, right? This is a 10, I need to make this change. It could be life or death, but yet they're not confident that they're able to make that change. And that's because they've tried, you know, many times in the past and not been able to make that change. And then how ready are you to make this change in your behavior? That's a totally different thing. So even if they're important, feels important and they're confident, they might not be ready to make that change. And that could be because they're uh, you know, comfortable with the way things are. So I just wanted to point out this readiness ruler tool and I'll see if I can throw it into um, when we send, I think we're good about the slides. We'll see if we can add that too. So I just wanted to share that. And this is where we use those open-ended questions and reflection skills, but especially for people who are new to motivational interviewing, I found this tool to be really helpful as a guide. Okay, I'm gonna go back into my PowerPoint. So now let's talk about um, things that we need to avoid when doing motivational interviewing. So we've talked about uh, the process, the approach, um, the stages of change, the skills, but now let's talk about common pitfalls to avoid. So um, when we're working with people who are experiencing ambivalence towards change, what we want to avoid is operating from our own agenda. Also, this is just a common pitfall that I see in um, newer clinicians, but also just people who, um, you know, we've been doing this for so long and we think we know what's best for people, right? So we're often eager to fix people's problems. And what this does is it moves us ahead of where they are. And that can damage that engagement and therapeutic relationship. And if you remember when we're going through these different stages, you know, you can go up and down that staircase. So if we damage the therapeutic relationship, we have to move back down the staircase to kind of uh, build from there again. So this, there's a star next to that statement, moving from one stage to the next can take six months. And the reason there's a star there is because that's just kind of like, um, that's the most common, that is, that is something that is common, but that does not mean that that's how long it takes for people. But um, that's like some, some, there's some percentage of people most commonly fall in that area, but moving from one stage to the other can take shorter than that. And it can take longer than that, especially to turn and we figure out, you know, what are the barriers, um, how comfortable people are with the way things are, but they say it can take about six months. 
in my experience working with people who have serious mental health conditions, it takes even longer. We might spend a year in contemplation and it might not be me who actually sees the change, right? And I think that's okay. I think another key point for you to remember is that sometimes you're just planting the seeds for it to blossom later. And so what you're doing, even if you only, if, even if you never get out of that uh, early stage, right, where you're really just developing that therapeutic relationship, if you're able to show them that they can have trusting relationships with providers, then they're likely to be able to move more quickly into the next stage in the future. So as we said too, people are gonna go back and forth and we need to make sure that whatever we're change we're trying to make, wherever we're coming from, that it's their agenda and not ours, right? And it doesn't mean that we don't hold them accountable to their agenda, but we, we want to make sure it's their reasoning and not our reasoning. You know, there's a whole nother side of this when it, we think about risk and we're not talking about behaviors that are so high risk that they're, you know, at risk of self-harm or harm to others. We're talking more about, even though, um, you know, sometimes we might be thinking about um, particular substances that are really high risk, but we still want to, um, yeah, just meet them where they are and try to move them through those stages. This is something that was created for motivational interviewing. This is the writing reflex. And this is something we all, I rarely use generalizations, but I feel like we all have. Um, people get into our roles because we're helpers, we're fixers, we want to problem solve, we want to make things better. So this is that urge to fix the problem by offering solutions or advice. Um, there is a time and place for advice. I do want to stress that as well. And there's a way through motivational interviewing to offer advice that comes off very non-judgmentally and non-lectury. It's called elicit, provide, elicit. And so what we do is we first ask them a question. So for example, um, you know, so what, uh, what do you know about diabetes based on your conversations with your doctor, right? Um, and then they might say, oh, they say that, you know, um, eating that much sugar is bad for me. And then you'd say, yeah, this is what I, if, you know, this is what I know about it. And you can elaborate on that, share a little bit more about some of the risks. And then you ask them again, um, you know, does any of that resonate with you? So it's elicit, provide, elicit, a key skill to offer um, solutions, um, advice in a non-judgmental way. And as always, we would ask permission. So um, yeah, we don't want to jump straight to offering a problem. And this is also something very helpful that can be used in your personal relationship. I found this particularly helpful when I'm comforting friends or people um, in distress is to ask, you know, do you want me to just to listen or do you want a uh, solution, right? So just something that you can use. I know people use that in couples counseling too. Um, and so we want to, um, yeah, avoid arguing for change, trying to get in that expert role, blaming, labeling, and actually blaming ourselves too, if people are not moving through the stages of change. So these are some examples, you know, you would feel better if your cholesterol levels, um, right, went down, you, you know. Um, so when people confront their fears, they get relief. So these are things that can be used, but it depends on where that person is at. And that's called the writing reflex. So we want to withhold that. In um, trainings that I do that are not only webinars, we make people practice these skills and specifically um, practice it not from the problem solving. And I will say people immediately do still go to problem solving. Okay, so this is what we went through today. Um, it is uh, motivational interviewing takes on the role supporting that person as they build motivation to move through those changes. Um, change is not easy and it takes time. So if you're ever feeling frustrated, just kind of think about yourself and a change that you've tried to make. Um, ORs are those key skills that take practice. So um, I encourage you to practice your open-ended questions and your reflections and to get additional um, training and support through that. Um, and those are really the key skills that help move people through these stages. Uh, and what we know is readiness to change is measured by how much change talk that you do hear. And the more change talk that you hear and you elicit, the more likely that person is to make that change. And lastly, I've said this a bunch, but meet that person where they are. Um, I still remember one of my early sessions with somebody, they mentioned that they had a slight interest in art. And the next time I brought like classes for them to sign up for art. And they were just like, they never talked to me about art again. Um, so really just truly hear where that person is, meet them where they are. And if you're ever feeling frustrated or stuck with somebody, I encourage you to, with uh, your supervisor or if you have a team, think through really what stage of change they are in. Because if you can properly identify what stage of change you're in, then you will know the right approach to working with that person. And then you will have much more success and less frustration in the process.
All right, so that is it. So I think we do, let's see. Oh, good, we have time for Q&A um, if people have any. I only see one question in the actual Q&A box, but if you have more, you can go ahead and put those in right now. All right, so I'm going to go ahead to the first question that we had um, put into the Q&A feature. Um, this is from Linda. We work with one health department that has case managers who have been seeing the same clients for 20 plus years. They are now using a tool that may recommend mental health or substance use treatment. Do you have any suggestions for how we can motivate case managers to use motivational interviewing with these clients who have refused treatment? for so many years and the case managers have not appropriately addressed those refusals. Hmm, <laughs> let's see. That's a few, I mean, it's like, do we need to use motivational interviewing with the um, the case managers or with the clients, right? Um, it seems like maybe, maybe both. Um, so I would say, you know, I think this is a change management thing with the staff, right? And helping them understand that um, how uh, offering these mental health or substance use treatment to people can help them, um, you know, help them in their journey, right? I think that with the clients, it depends on what people have already been offering them and what's important to them. So it sounds like they hopefully have that first stage already accomplished, right? It seems like if they've been working with somebody for 20 years, they already have the engagement down. Um, so really what they can do is try to assess who needs that and tie it into what they think is important to them already um, and then just offer it. You know, you can't, unless it needs to be, you can't force anybody to engage in mental health or substance use treatment um, unless it's like court ordered, right? Um, so I think the good thing is they have the engagement tool down, but I think before you have them kind of talking about it with clients, you need to make sure that they understand the value themselves. Otherwise, the way they offer it to people, whether or not it's something they're interested in or that is in connected, the connected to their values, then they're not going to have a really good success. Um, so, yeah, that's two. There's two things first. Address the uh, clinicians and then address the clients and then monitor those conversations, you know, have them report back and hold them accountable to doing that. Um, all right, I can actually, I see just one more. There, sometimes there's so many, it's hard to um, read through it. But okay, from Stephanie, what is a good way to get the client to really believe in themselves and their ability, right? So that's building their uh, confidence. So um, a great way to do that is to look at things in the past that they've done, right? So in the past, have they had any successful change? What did that look like? How are they able to maintain it? So it doesn't have to be the same thing that they're trying to change, but it really just has to be um, building that confidence. When people are able to do something once, they then feel more confident that they're able to do it again. Another way to help people believe in themselves is through like self-mastery, right? So what we're trying to do there is giving them things that they can um, master to make them feel more confident in general as who they are as a person, right? So that's self-mastery. That's one of the foundational kind of skills to recovery is people feeling able to do things that contribute, right? So that might be helping them identify things that they're good at, uh, pointing that out, helping them learn a new skill so they're able to master that skill, even if it's completely unrelated to the change. Um, so really helping them, you know, believe in themselves and determine that they're able to, um, yeah, that they're able to do anything successfully. Um, let alone something related to that change. So I would say, yeah, looking back to the past and then really um, helping them and also using that tool that I shared briefly, the confidence ruler, because when you use that, um, it, it helps you identify, you know, really um, how confident they are, what would they need to be a little more confident? And, you know, you can also identify why aren't they lower on that confidence scale, which can then give you things to kind of reinforce. Okay. Any other questions? I don't see any other questions in okay. the chat or in the Q&A feature. So if it's all right with you, Shireen, can we uh, move on to evaluation? If you have any closing comments or remarks that you'd like to share before we go to evaluation, please feel free. 
Yeah, I just want to thank everybody for coming. Like that is somebody said a quick overview, and I know I speak particularly fast, but it's even quicker. Um, but this is the foundation. And then I think if this resonated with you as approach, there's a lot of skill building courses out there that I recommend you attend. Um, because it is a this is a skill building thing that that you need. And the more you practice it, the better you'll be able to then just readily engage in it, even if it's just even in one time encounters. Um, so I encourage you, if it resonated, to really dive in and start practicing the skill. So thank you so much, everybody. And um, they'll share with you now how you can claim credit if you'd like that. All right. Thank you so much, Shireen. And thank you so much to all of you for participating in today's webinar. We really do value your feedback and invite you to evaluate our event today. Um, please complete the brief SAMHSA required survey by visiting the link presented on your screen. Um, the link can also be found in the Zoom chat feature if you need to click on it there. Completion of this survey will provide information to SAMHSA and will assist us in planning future events. Afterwards, you will be automatically redirected to additional questions from the Southeast MHTTC regarding the impact of today's event on your knowledge and skills. And there you will also have the opportunity to download a certificate attend of attendance for your records should you need it. Just allow about five to 10 seconds for your browser to redirect you. Uh, please visit our website to learn more about our upcoming events. And that is going to conclude today's webinar. Thank you so much, everyone.